Welcome back, everyone, to the second part of our series on the Supreme Court's decision to allow cities to ban homeless encampments. In our last episode, we covered the legal context and implications of this ruling, and today we're going to be focusing on the real-world impact of this decision on the clients we serve, and we're also going to be talking about some actionable steps that we can take to fight the criminalization of homelessness. Some steps that we can take together individually, some steps that we can come together as a community to take as well. So today I'm so excited. We are fortunate enough to have two super distinguished guests with us. We have Professor Stephen Snavely, a leading expert in constitutional law and human rights who has spent decades challenging measures that criminalize homelessness. And joining him is council member Rob Moore, a dedicated dedicated public servant and street dog coalition volunteer who is deeply committed to addressing housing affordability and homelessness at the local level. level. So today, they're both going to help us really explore some of the, the challenges ahead and we're all going to talk about how we can mobilize together for change. So welcome to the podcast, Professor Snabley and Council Member Moore. Yeah. Glad to be here. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for being here. And I will start off by saying the same thing that I started off last week, and that is simply that um, I wish we were here under more fortunate circumstances. I, I I can't wait to invite you back when we are celebrating something good that the Supreme Court does. Um, <laughs> but in the meantime, in all seriousness, I am I am so, so, so grateful to have you both today here to discuss you know, take us one step further. So like I said earlier, last week, we got a really good idea of how we got to this point in history, what the situations that led to where we're at now, um, it, it, essentially how they kind of sculpted this Supreme Court decision. And we started to talk a little bit about what some of the implications are and 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 how we can kind of combat this decision on a local level. And I'm really, really excited now because I know that both of you have very different backgrounds, very different areas of expertise, and you're both very, very passionate about making the world a more equitable place for individuals who are experiencing homelessness, at risk of experiencing homelessness, um, especially individuals who are taking care of animals, who have pets. So I'm excited to, to dive deep today. And I also want to remind our audience, if you're tuning in live, you know we love engaging with you in real time. We were all just talking about how much we love to talk. <laughs> before we went live. So, um, you know, I, I really should say that this that this uh, event today is an opportunity for not just us to talk, but for you to get your questions answered as well. So please go ahead and share your questions with us in the chat box, share your comments, share any feedback you have, any ideas that you think might be worth exploring. We are we are here for it. So let's let's get this let's get this conversation started. Um, why don't we actually take a second, really quickly? Why don't I get um, a brief introduction from each of you? Maybe we can maybe we can start with um, with Professor Snavely. Can you, in just a few sentences, tell us a little bit about yourself, why you're here, and why you care about this topic? Yes, well, I'm a professor at the U University of Miami School of Law. Uh, you know, my involvement in this homelessness issue goes back to about 30 years. I have been co-counsel in, uh, was co-counsel in a long-running case in the city of Miami, Pottinger v. City of Miami, that essentially put some real limits on the power of police officers to arrest people experiencing homelessness for you know, what we called life-sustaining conduct misdemeanors, relatively minor misdemeanors like being in the park after hours, sleeping in public, you know, when there was basically they had no choice but to do so because they were they were homeless. 
And even though that consent decree was a federal consent decree it was terminated in 2019, many of the pr uh, protections still do exist under City of Miami Police Department orders. I've also been co-counsel in a case more recently, Cooper Levy v. City of Miami, that challenged the systematic sweeps of encampments and destruction of property. I've also written about the issue and been involved in some community advocacy. So it's something I've really um, uh, put a lot of time and thought into, and um, like many other people, I was disappointed by the Supreme Court's decision, but I think it's important to see, you know, what can we do now? Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Council Member, council member Moore, up, up to you. Take Thank you. I, uh, yeah, I've been a council member in the town of Los Gatos for the past two years or so. I was elected in November of 2022. Um, I am not the traditional person in my community. I'm um, the youngest council member um, by a good margin. Most of my colleagues are um, over the age of 60. I'm, I'm 26. And um, Los Gatos is a, uh, is a very different city than Miami. And so I think that's an interesting perspective. We're a very, um, we're a small, medium-sized city. We have 33,000 residents. They're very affluent. We have a small homeless population of, you know, 50 to 100, depending on the count. Um, but we are directly next to um, the city of San Jose, which has one of the largest homeless populations in the entire country. Um, and my, before I was uh, elected as a council member, I did a variety of things in the nonprofit space. I used to run a homeless shelter at our county fairgrounds um, that had about 80 beds. Um, and, uh, you know, I learned a lot in that experience of, of working directly with people experiencing homelessness. And this is something I am incredibly passionate about. I think we are, our cities are not approaching homelessness as the human rights crisis that it is and the emergency that it is. And so I think the Supreme Court decision is very disappointing um, because I think it empowers cities to, to be worse actors than they've already been. Wow. Shots fired. OK, yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's really well said. Uh, and it's obvious that you're both so, so passionate about what you do. And I'm I'm just taking a little bit of a moment of silence, a moment of solace and excitement for the for the fact that we have people um, in our network, you know, members of the Street Dog Coalition family, which both of you are, that are helping to address this issue and solve some of the problems with, within this issue at all different levels. So the first question here, and you know, all the questions I have today, I feel like we could have different podcast episodes about the answers to each of these questions because they're so juicy and they're so lengthy. But can can you this is kind of where we left off at our last in our last episode. Maybe each of you can tell us from your unique perspective, from your different experiences, how in your opinion can supporters and advocates whether they have lived experience, whether they have you know no lived experience, whether they're new to activism or they're seasoned activists what can people do to get involved in in opposing the criminalization of homelessness at the local level? What, what kind of strategies have you seen to be most effective? I can jump in first. Um, uh, so I think the advocates play an incredibly important role in all of this. Um, policymakers are listening to the people that show up and the people that that are you know willing to to participate in the conversation oftentimes you know i we have city council meetings all the time where there will be 10 people who show up that i know do not represent a majority of the opinion of people in the community but they are the loudest voices and so they uh their opinion is given more weight um i find it to be very disruptive in the best possible way when people with lived experience come and speak to a city council, especially when they're talking about um, the policies that are going to be impacting these people in real life. I think that, that many policymakers, frankly, have never met a person who is homeless or has experienced homelessness. They've never had a conversation with them about what it's 
actually like to live outside and and what it would be like to you know after that city council meeting have to go and sleep you know uh, in a tent or in your car or in a shelter and so um, any way that people are willing to show up and speak to their city council I think is is really helpful and and good um I think what's important to be able to do that is to get looped into some sort of network or um some sort of uh, any sort of uh, community where people care about this. So whether that is a, you know, anti-racist group in your city or a, you know, in the case of the Street Dog Coalition, right? People that care about the veterinary uh, care of animals, right? Um, which isn't necessarily a natural progression in most people's heads. I think however you can connect with people that um, that care about the issue, I think is, is really good. The last thing I'll say is like follow a council member or two or your mayor on whatever social media platform um, you're on because they're if they're good at their job, they're posting updates regularly and, and whether or not you agree with them, you can get information about what's coming up at those meetings because no one should be expected to come to every city council meeting, but it's important to know when you do need to. Perfect. Yeah, and I, I, I might want to follow up with a few things. I, I've that's been I, I think everything that Councilmember Moore is saying is is great advice. And just to give a couple examples from uh, Miami, I'm a member of the Miami Coalition to Advance Ra Racial Equity, which is obviously, as the name indicates, broadly concerned with racial equity issues, but focuses especially on housing and, and homelessness. And so, for example, uh, the city of Miami Beach, which you'd think in some ways likes to present itself as being very liberal, and but they've had a, a big crackdown. They're really trying, I think, to just push everyone who is homeless out of Miami Beach, arresting people for sleeping on the beach or in parks. And... Um, which of course we know arrests just make the situation worse for people who are homeless. It's harder to get housing and jobs and people lose property and, and their belongings and so on, not to mention what how do they get separated from their pets and, and those kinds of questions. So we had um, a, a, a sleep in at uh, on Miami Beach at the park there because that's illegal. And so we had first a demonstration that went for a few hours and that also got the attention of many tourists. You know, Miami Beach is uh, very dependent on tourism. And there are a lot of people from Europe who were, I think, just surprised to see that, what, people get arrested for being homeless in, in here in Miami? And so, uh, and then the sleep in, the police in that instance, it's interesting, you know, decided not to arrest anybody, even though really it was violating the ordinance. Um, but it still got a lot of publicity, I think, and drew people's attention, you know, to uh, the what the city of Miami Beach is doing. And so, you know, sometimes this sort of creative thinking about, well, how do we get attention <laughs> and cultivating uh, relationships with reporters, of course, to make sure people know about it in advance. Um, and I, I would also second the point about showing up at um, city council meetings. I think that I don't think there's any time when MCARE members and other uh, advocates within the city of Miami or Miami-Dade County have showed up to a city commission that it's really changed anything. Um, but sometimes it's slowed down the process, and it's also, I think, surprised commissioners if you get a lot of people out there like, what, there are that many people who are who, who aren't anti-homeless, who, who aren't of the sort of, you know, get this out of sight, I don't care what it takes, just, you know, I don't, I don't like seeing people experiencing homelessness on the streets. You know, there, there are people, a lot of people besides that, who are sympathetic and see it as a problem of uh, lack, lack of affordable housing and not of you know bad people taking over parts of the city and being a nuisance. So I think there's a lot of room for that. Um, I do think there's room also though for still for legal challenges to be made. And I think advocates trying to work with uh, law groups, lawyers interested in bringing those challenges even after grants pass the Supreme Court decision. I think there is room for some other challenges. And I'll just give one example to yeah. talk about more if you'd like, which is that, okay, the Supreme Court, the US Supreme Court based on the federal constitution, the eighth amendment ban on cruel and unusual punishment said, no, you know, arresting people for being homeless isn't cruel and unusual punishment. That's the Supreme Court ruling. Of course, it doesn't require 
cities to do anything. It just, but it does allow them to undertake some mm -hmm. bad policies. But right. many state constitutions have similar provisions and yeah. some state uh, courts could adopt a different interpretation, one that's more protective uh, of the, the rights of people living on the streets, especially than the Supreme Court took. And there's other potential legal challenges. And so I think one of the best ways for legal challenges to take place is if it's in coordination with community groups who know what the real issues are and what the situation is. That's such a, a great point. And, and maybe we can talk a little bit more about these groups. I, I love this reminder that, um, you know, while this ruling is disappointing and not what we hoped for, it it's certainly not a ruling that... Um, puts a national ban on encampments, right? It, it just, it, it unfortunately hands the power back to the states, which of course, it, you know, um, allows some states to, to, to take the high road and other states to take the low road, which, you know, we've seen in other decisions that the Supreme Court has made recently, uh, you know, like the decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. And, and I really appreciate you talking about partnerships and I know from my experience working with the Street Dog Coalition, everything that we do is in unbridled collaboration with other advocates, with other groups who are who are working to protect protect marginalized individuals as well, to working to protect pets, um, sometimes even very specifically working to help the unhoused population. So I'm curious to know how how can these alliances, these partnerships, especially ones that are focused on affordable housing um, and, you know, different social justice organizations, how can we kind of come together and rally around, rally around combating this decision at a local level? How can we kind of strengthen those partnerships, um, you know, in ways that we, during the peak of the Black Lives Matter movement, summer of 2020, when all these organizations started to really, really come together and kind of put their differences to the side, sort of, kind of, right, to 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 kind of um, explore that moment in history. H how can we do something like that now to gain momentum? Do you want to go ahead, Professor? Well, I, I think you may be the better expert here, but I, I'll just say, I think some of it is a, the narrative. And uh, look, one of the bad things about the Supreme Court decision was it adopts this narrative, well, twofold. It's an incredibly complex problem, and they kind of especially pin blame on mental health and, and substance abuse issues. And I think it's important to point, no, it's a matter of a lack of affordable housing. That is the fundamental cause. And and it's sort of like, um, as some, <laughs> excuse me, researchers have um, suggested, Greg Colburn and and um, uh, Clayton Aldern, uh, who are researchers at the University of Washington, that is the game of musical chairs. If you have a table with nine chairs and, and 10 people, it might be true that people with mental health issues or physical disabilities are less, are more likely to be chairless, so to speak. But the real solution is, instead of worrying about that, get another chair, make sure there's enough chairs for people. And the same thing is true of housing, because I think that um, that might open up the more the uh, the narrative on, on a number of housing issues like tenants' rights, evictions cause housing, uh, homelessness often. People are on the brink of homelessness, a uh, um, paycheck away. And also, I think that if you, the statistics on homelessness, <coughs> you have a little bit of a cold here, the, the statistics on homelessness also understate the problem, these point in time annual counts, because there are many people who are homeless for brief periods. There are people doubling up who aren't counted. There's undercounts, but there's a lot more, uh, the homelessness is a tip of an iceberg of an affordable housing problem. And I think, you know, framing it that way might help just con building the connections between groups advocating for people experiencing homelessness and people advocating more broadly for housing uh, affordability and and other services as well that um, that many people can't uh, access now that's a great point yeah. 
Yeah, I think one of one of the beauties of building coalitions around fighting homelessness is that I've never met someone in my life that is pro homelessness, right? A lot of these, you know, political issues, you have sort of, you know, a pro and an anti position. No one wants homelessness, right? We can take very different approaches to how to solve it, you know, some of those approaches being more empathetic and data driven, and some of those approaches being really, you know, sort of regressive. Um, but but I think what you were getting at in your question about, you know, I think some of those coalitions from, you know, the summer of 2020 actually still exist. And I think um, those same people still care about many of the same issues, you know, in, in my community, we have um, some of the the sort of leaders on this issue have been people in the faith community um, who have been providing services to people experiencing homelessness for, you know, years and years in sort of a, um, at a very, you know, uh, because of lack of resources, very basic sort of way. And so um, when I got elected to the council, a lot of these groups, um, you know, we were able to come together. So we brought together faith leaders, we have our anti-racism coalition, we have, um, groups that care about national politics, like indivisible groups or together we will groups that are, you know, sort of these democratic coalitions of people that are, you know, interested in in doing good. Um, and and we were able to kind of all come together. And what it did require, I think, and I think this is true in a lot of communities, is you do have to have an advocate who has some, you know, power, right? So like, for me, this was an issue that was very personally, uh, it, I cared a lot about. And so we pushed for the creation of a, um, we call a homeless hotel program, um, where we put up people who are experiencing homelessness in uh, hotels during the worst weather events in our community. So for about, um, each person gets about 30 days a year uh, during extreme cold, um, extreme rain, wind, all of these sort of like life-threatening circumstances where someone being outside is could could genuinely lead to their death. Um, and we pushed for that and it required, you know, money and investment and partnership. Uh, but when we were able to bring this, when, the council meeting where where this was on the agenda, we were asking for, you know, about $100,000 um, from, you know, the town and the county. And we had never, the town had really never invested in anything in the space of homelessness. And the huge coalition we had, we had dozens of people fill the room. A lot of those same people that sort of like built legitimacy as activists during, you know, Black Lives Matter and all of that um, came back and and said, this is something we we care about. This is sort of the, the next step of our community taking care of our vulnerable population. And it was an overwhelming success. We we passed it on a 3-2 vote, um, which is, um, you know, not, uh, you know, what, whatever it takes, right? But what I think is a really good testament to how powerful the work of helping homeless folks is, is the next year when we came, when we revisited, um, continuing to invest in this program, and in other services as well. Um, it was a unanimous vote. Everybody supported it. And the council members who uh, were not supportive of it explicitly said, I was wrong. I am so glad that we are investing in taking care of our homeless neighbors. And I think that's a, a huge you know, testament to how, how important that sort of coalition building is and, and yeah. also just doing the work. And, and the last thing I'll say on that is, is that has now allowed us the space to push for even more programming. So now we're looking at providing case management. Um, we have a nonprofit, the Anti-Racism Coalition, that is providing, um, last year provided like $35,000 of rental assistance to folks in our community. And so I think when you're, when you're able to demonstrate success through this investment, it really helps, um, you know, I think build momentum to continue the work. Oh, that's such a that's such a great point. I think oftentimes some of our policymakers and even some, you know, advocates and activists who might be feeling kind of hopeless and helpless during this political political climate, just hearing you say like being able to demonstrate success um, and to show different stakeholders and other communities and other lawmakers that this is possible, that certain solutions do fix, um, you know, even if it's on a local level, e level, even if it's temporarily, you know, before more funding or more support is received, it, solutions, you know, these activists, these advocates, they they have solutions that work to to 
fix problems, to help people. And all they really need is the opportunity and the backing from lawmakers and the funding, of course, and the buy-in from stakeholders to to kind of bring these ideas into fruition, to experiment, to lead with compassion, to 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 kind of um, come together and share experiences based on these different coalitions, areas of, of expertise, and from there, decide how to move forward. And I, and I really, really appreciate that, that insight. It, it is, it's great to hear when people can admit they're wrong. We love that. That just like does not happen enough in life, uh, especially when it comes to policymaking and advocacy. And, and I wanted to share a comment. Uh, one of our one of our lovely Street Dog Coalition family members, fellow advocate, John Mark, uh, who does a lot of work with individuals who are experiencing homelessness and who has lived experience himself. John Mark said that his first objective engaging with homeless individuals is educating them about what public property is. Uh, John Mark says, allowing, allowing individuals who are homeless to engage with law enforcement on public property is an immediate catch-22. It leaves an opening for self-defense in municipal court. Um, and uh, individuals who are homeless, knowing what public property is, uh, can be to their legal benefit. I'm wondering, maybe Professor Snabley, you have some insight here. What... What does the role of being on public property, uh, how does that impact whether or not an individual who is, you know, might fall victim to an encampment sweep, like how does, like where you're standing and where your stuff is on, how, how does that impact your ability to defend yourself, your ability to um, have even a legal case? Well, you know, we are a very uh, property oriented country. Unfortunately, I think in some ways, it, you know, the, the Constitution protects a right to property. It doesn't protect a right to health or housing and so on. But leaving that aside, I say that because, first off, the, the big divide is, I think, in many for many people experiencing homelessness would be private property versus public property. If it's privately owned property, even under the theory uh, that was rejected by the Supreme Court and Grants Pass, I mean, you're trespassing and and it's never, no court has ever held you have, if you have no place to go, that even if it's a vacant private lot, that you have a, that you could just be immune from arrest for being there. Now, maybe whether the police actually exercise their discretion that, to do, arrest you, I don't know. But so being on public, in public spaces, I mean, the, the remember that, the grants passed, even though it didn't accept that it was a constitutional level right. I mean, many or uh, local governments still would take the view that there's no point in arresting people who are in parks or for sleeping on sidewalks or the beach if they are experiencing homelessness, and especially especially if they have no other place to go. Now, sometimes it's you know qualified by saying, or they shouldn't be arrested if they're. Uh, resting or sleeping in public spaces or putting their property there unless there's shelter available. But even there, that, you know, there's good reasons why people might not, even though they're living on the streets, accept shelter. And one of them might be that shelter doesn't take pets. And they, they what are they supposed to do? Pets are just incredibly important to everybody who has them, including people living on the streets. But there may be other issues. That the shelters may require religious um observances that don't comport with what the person believes the, and shelters may not be uh, may not be um, safe in some cases they may be dangerous one could go on they may be single sex you're part of a couple but i think the role of you know identifying public spaces is at least in a city or local area where they're not out to criminalize homelessness that's important i mean it, and we're really talking i think about parks and, and public squares um right. and sidewalks uh as opposed to you know a, a, a parking lot at a private strip mall or something i mean you just it's it's usually i think just something that you, you just have to kind of intuit because there's not signs saying this is public property but you can usually i suppose would be the idea to tell is this something that looks like public space? You may be more protected there. Now, after grants pass with some cities taking it as an excuse to criminalize homelessness, 
it may not be particularly safe. That's the problem, even if it is public space. Yeah, absolutely. And and I, and I appreciate you making that clarification. And and I also appreciate you mentioning, because um, my cat is trying to get off my lap and I'm trying to let her. Uh, it's my cat's world. We're all just kind of living in it. Um, so I appreciate you mentioning, of course, that there are so many individuals who are trying to decipher, you know, what is public property, what is not public property, um, which faith organization can help me, which has slammed the door in my face a million times. This, you know, we're, you, you said it, we're living in a country that puts a lot of emphasis on property, a lot of emphasis on religion. And um, it's, I think it makes it kind of difficult and confusing for someone who is unhoused, has 10 million problems seemingly to deal with on a daily basis, um, sleep being one of them, it, 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 it becomes, you know, even as an advocate, disorienting to think, like, where should I direct these individuals? Um, because maybe their faith doesn't align with the faith of an organization that could help them, right? Uh, maybe somewhere that, you know, we suggest they sleep ends up, you know, falling being part of a, of a sweep. So it's, it's, it's hard for advocates and activists. It's of course, exceptionally hard for the clients that we serve. And I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering what are your insights on how, and this is, this is we're, as we're kind of wrapping up here, you know, we have this better sense of how we can work together at a local level to make sure that we are engaging the right policymakers to make sure that we know our rights. Um, but if we are a pet owner, if we're a pet owner sleeping on the street, and we have John Mark here uh, in our comments as well, talking about how a lot of the churches and different interfaith communities where he's from um, have actually really failed the homeless community, which is which is sad. And, you know, with every success, there's probably a, a dozen failures in terms of individuals who might mean well, um, but who are just not able to provide the support that, you know, our unhoused neighbors need. How can individuals who are unhoused, who are living on the street, who have pets, what advice would you give them? How can they use their voice to advocate for change um, what, what are your thoughts and insights on that? Yeah, I would say it's, you need to find, uh, places that, you know, are going to be sympathetic to you. I think, you know, in, in my community, we have with this hotel program, some of the hotels take pets, some of them don't. Right. And so it's about finding the, the right place for you. Um, I, I think from an advocacy perspective, there are, you know, I think when people are trying to, um, in good faith, serve the homeless community, like you said, mistakes will be made and and there will be oversights. And so uh, we learned a ton in my community, you know, from year one to year two about changes that need to be made in the process and all of that. Um, and and pets, you know, of of course, factor into that. And so, making sure that that shelters and we're places where we're telling people to go um, allow for pets, I think, is is critical, or at least some of them do, right? So people that that have pets have places to go. Um, and so, I would encourage people that you know are in the advocacy about this issue, um, make sure that you're talking about your pets and and um, their needs as as well as um, the needs of the homeless individuals. That's great advice. Thank you so much. Professor Snavely, what do you think? Well, I, I, I would add a couple things. I'm talking to people on the streets over the years, and partly for the legal work and partly for the advocacy work, I certainly get the sense uh, a lot of people have a sense either from their own experience or from talking to other people who are experiencing homelessness about the differences in shelters in, in the, the city of Miami. And, and so there's a lot to learn, I think, from other people on the streets, just, you know, as an individual about what, what their policies are and, and, how, and they are, they can be fairly uh, different in just some are much more regimented and a little bit, I mean, I've been in them, you know, prison or jail like, and others are more, more welcoming and, and, 
and less of that institutional controlling feel. And so, I mean, part of it is I, I think the similarly, I mean, where f can you, um, with at least the no assurance, but less likelihood of police harassment, um, where could you be if you're living on the streets? Where where could you be? Well, uh, uh, it, that can change so much from time to time because sometimes under pressure from city commissioners or the police themselves decide they're going to clear out all the encampments under an underpass somewhere. But but they leave just maybe a mile away. Everybody stays there. And so there's a kind of street knowledge about that, about where there are um, food sharing programs, mm -hmm. even where, and like the city of Miami really has virtually outlawed them, but they still go on. Um, so th there's a lot of street knowledge, I think, about that. I, but two other, well, maybe one other point I would make is that, um, well, two. One, one is that in the more bureaucratic big city like Miami and even more New, New York and I'm sure L.A., although L.A. doesn't have that many shelters, I mean, you can't just pick and choose the shelter. It's all done through the Miami-Dade County Homeless Trust, and there's a single number, and if, the, if that's where they tell you the beds are open, and that would be that would be it. So that can be challenging. I mean, you don't, you know, you could just stay on the streets, but I mean, unfortunately, you know, you may know about which shelters, but you don't necessarily get to sort of pick them because there are so few shelter spaces. But the other thing is that um, yeah, I would say, where is, I think, well, uh, advocates ought to ask, where is the funding coming from? When it comes from the um, federal government, there are some strings attached. And for example, even religious sh shelters that accept funding for, at least for the beds they're funding, they can't impose religious uh, worship requirements on mm. people. Um, you know, one last thing I would say is that I think, I mean, local advocacy is incredibly important. And, and I like Council Member Moore's point about how some of the local officials were sort of converted. <laughs> and that's good because, I mean, one of the things is they also, local officials and local advocates need to address in some areas state interference. In Florida, we now have what's called HB 1365, which is intended to force criminalization policies in all communities. And many communities are now uh, grappling with that. It takes effect October 1st. Even Governor Newsom's executive order with the threat of withholding funding, uh, you know, puts lim uh, some pressures on local governments. I'm sure the council member is very aware of that. And, mm -hmm. and there's the Cicero Institute. It's based in um, Austin, Texas. It, it's one one of those tech, you know, billionaires who fled California to Texas because he believes in freedom, uh, and um, they have model legislation and is trying to impose criminalization where for, for state legislatures to adopt. And a number of states have either considered it or adopted it. And so I think some of the advocacy needs to be on the state level or focus there as well. And getting the local uh, officials, though, invested, I think, as, as seems like it's happened in Moscatos, uh, is is a key uh, part of the work I think advocates can do. Yeah, and I'll just say on the your your point, I think that's such a, a very good point because I think in the national media, we hear about someone like Governor Ron DeSantis taking this, you know, really um heavy-handed negative approach to homelessness. Governor Gavin Newsom is is no friend to the homeless community, especially, you know, in light of this decision there. I think um Governor Newsom, I've seen uh statements of his embracing you know, this decision and saying that this is what cities need. And and he's he is very much blaming city. I mean, on one hand, he's blaming cities for not building housing, which I think is correct. Right. I think there is a, a huge um, issue with cities not building housing. But but on the other hand, even in a progressive state like California, the state government is is taking an approach that that is not helping our, our homeless community. And I think, um, you know, shows where some of the the real divisions on this issue are that that someone like you know Newsom and DeSantis can can agree about how poorly to treat our homeless neighbors yeah. is is not good um, and and requires advocacy at at you know the local state and and even federal level. Yikes! You, Newsom and DeSantis, you heard it here first. Newsom is not a friend to our unhoused neighbors. Yeah, it's um. Yeah. It, it you guys raise such incredible points here. Obviously, the road forward is is nuanced. Uh, it requires a a 
you know, a, 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 a knowledge of legal frameworks that are holding us back. It also, you know, requires a knowledge of how we can leverage the law to defend ourselves and stick up for our rights. And I also really appreciate this. Um, you know, we at the Street Dog Coalition, a lot of how we decide where to focus our energy, a lot of the determinations we make about individuals, about the problems that our clients who are experiencing homelessness face, um, these come from conversations with these individuals, right? It, it sounds elementary, but it's it's true. Um, there are a, a, a lot of our unhoused neighbors are supporting one another. They're very, very resourceful. They're, you know, highly intelligent, and they are oftentimes more compassionate and more willing to help one another than, um, you know, coalition members. That's not to romanticize their experience and the conflicts they have with one another, but there is this whole, you know, network of people with lived experience who were formerly unhoused, who are currently unhoused, who kind of know best in many ways how to help their community. So I really appreciate this invitation to listen to their, um, you know, their thoughts, some of their solutions, some of their insights and experience. And and I want to leave you guys with with one final question here. Our, our fabulous uh, guest from last week, Kylie Clark, has shared a couple of questions, and I think one of them is really important. Um, so and I'm going to add a little twist to it. So if you guys had a billboard, if each of you had a billboard and you could, I'm, I'm adding the billboard element. Kylie did not mention a billboard, but if you had, if you had a billboard and you could write a message, um, a message to housed people, right? Something that you wish that they knew either about their unhoused neighbors, uh, you know, how to get involved, compassion, what message would you put on that billboard for regular people like me, regular people like the veterinarians and social workers who who care, who are compassionate about this community, but who might be hesitant to take a step forward? What's the one thing you wish your housed neighbors knew? If you could put it on a billboard. I'll, I'll pitch two that are that'll both be bad. Um, I I think one of the the big problems is is the dehumanization of of folks experiencing homelessness, right? And so I think any message that helps you know communicate um, these folks are your neighbors, these folks are residents. So um, maybe the billboard says talk to your homeless neighbors. I think it, I really try to use that word neighbors a lot when talking about homeless folks because they live in our community too. And I think a lot of people don't think of them that way. The other one I try to use is homeless residents. So something like homeless residents are residents of X city too, or something. Um, because I, I really just don't think that, I, I really think that people aren't thinking about homeless folks as member, legitimate members of the community in the same way they would someone who lives next door to them. Okay. I love that. Those are both great. I was expecting something really, really, really bad, but those are, those are great. Those are great. I see what you did there. Professor Snabley, how about you? Well, this is outside my professorial <laughs> expertise, but I was thinking a little about it and I guess uh, a billboard, I, uh, I, I could almost imagine at the top of it, uh, I'm not sure how much text we can have, but homelessness is an affordable housing problem. And at the below, we are the homeless. And in the, in, in the middle, photos of people kind of in their ordinary work guard, because you read about people who are, are teachers or People, I mean, and many people who are living on the streets or in shelters experiencing homelessness work, a construction worker, day labor. But to kind of get this image out of people's minds that these are all just fail failures who either made bad choices or their mental health or or uh, substance abuse problems led them to bad choices. These are yeah, there are people there are people with mental health or drug abuse problems. Who are housed? I mean, it, that it is a problem people can have, but this idea that uh, actually they're they're almost the invisible homeless, meaning the people who are just going to work and living in their cars, 
or or living on in a street encampment under a bridge, but to show people kind of I accidentally hit the keyboard there. <laughs> Just that's okay. That's okay. Do. It's there are people who are who are um uh yes, I mean they're working, they just can't afford housing. And so something that would get people to see, yeah, you know, it's it's not some special different type of human being, it's just ordinary people. That's a that's, great billboard. I like that billboard. <laughs> that's a really, really great billboard. I, th I think this might be now part of your expertise, Professor Snavely. That's <laughs> that's really fantastic. And I love this visual element um, and really turning this idea of what an unhoused person looks like on its head, right? Because struggling with mental health, struggling with addiction and experiencing homelessness, like those two things are not mutually exclusive. Not everyone who is unhoused has a mental health issue and not everyone with a mental health issue is living on the street. So I, I really appreciate, um, and you know, that's unfortunately the world we live in, right? Where people need to be able to see themselves in the demographic of people who really need their help the most in, in order to care. Um, I promised that myself I would not leave this on a on a on a miserable note. So <laughs> I actually think that this that this idea, both of these billboards fill me with a sense of hope, fill me with a sense of excitement. And and I really want to thank you both so, so, so much. Council member Moore, uh, Professor Snavely. It it really means the world to our supporters to have your expertise here on you know on this podcast during this live event, getting our answers, getting our questions answered in real time. It is invaluable to us, and I just know that the individuals who are tuning into a recording of of this podcast episode as well, they're going to get a lot out of this. Um, and I, I'm really filled with a sense of hope and. I, I find that sometimes while things may go wrong on a national level, it is an invitation to us as advocates, as activists, as people with lived experience to um, to step it up, to lean into one another, to link arms together, to call our friends at different coalitions, meet and um, and to to commit to making a change on a local level now more than ever. So that's that's what I'm taking away from this conversation is that it is possible. And it's, it's, you know, what we kind of left our last week, our episode last week with the same thought, you know, n now the power is in our hands and we're going to make the Supreme court regret putting it in our hands because we're ready to fight. And, and I just want to thank you both so so much for your time today for your expertise it it means the world to me it means the world to our supporters and um and i can't wait to invite you back next time when we are celebrating s something good politically it might be 20 years from now but <laughs> but really thank you both so much and i want to thank everyone who tuned in live and shared your questions with us it made the conversation even even more fruitful um, Professor Snavely, Council Member Moore, thank you so much for your time again, and I can't wait to have you back soon. Thank well, you so great. much. Thank you for having us. And, thank uh, you. Thank you. What Street Dog does, and it's yes. very important work. <laughs> thank you so much, and we'll talk to you both soon. Okay. Bye.